This program is funded in part by Mass Humanities. Rock and rolls. On a track now. Let me tell you about this man I know. He's a master storyteller. He's from this little fishing village in Cape Cod. And he has this passion, this story that he's been wanting to tell for years. One that you may have heard, but not so much in this way. So a few years ago, he decides he's just going to go for it. He's going to make a film about it. And he decides, you know, he's going to tell a buddy about it. And that buddy hears the idea, and he likes the story. So they borrow a camera, and they go for it. And they do it week after week after week. And some pros come along to help. It was a little rough at first, but they keep doing it. And they're off. On Valentine's Day of 1779, the greatest explorer of his time, Captain James Cook, died on the shores of the Big Island of Hawaii. In a foolish gamble, he marched ashore with John Ledyard and other Royal Marines, attempting to take a local chief hostage to secure the return of a stolen boat. It ended with Ledyard's company foundering back to the HMS Resolution, and Cook faced down on the water with a dagger in his back. In response, the ship bombarded the shore as the Hawaiians claimed Cook's body for ceremonial dismemberment. The Brits would leave Hawaii with only partial remains of their esteemed commander. I'm Andrew Buckley, Gumshoe historian. I've been an investigator, writer, photographer, politician, and clan digger. The past isn't dead, it's all around us, found in regular, everyday places. You just need to know where to look. With a crew gathered from coastal towns in New England, we take history out of the archives and down to the street level. We check out the players, the places they lived, and hear from the people who know them best. We get dirty, we make mistakes, and we have fun. We're practicing history without a license. Hit and run. Right after the signing of the peace treaty in Paris, um, you know, the, the plans are laid for the first voyages to Canton. So what do you want to do about that audio? Um, well, we've got to be able to use it because Mary's the foremost historian on Northwest Coast fur trade. I think we just be, have to be able to use it, bring it down. And we'll use it. We'll use it. We'll need to make some corrections, but I can't promise what the end result is going to be. No. <laughs> Do our best. Okay. I've been following the Columbia Expedition since 1995 uh, when I started doing research for my book, The Bostoner. It's had a hold of me ever since. It's local. In fact, it's very local. This guy, John Kendrick, was from two towns over from where I grew up. Yeah. Nobody knows about it. This is the story that your high school teacher never told you. And uh, Andy, we'll start with you. Go ahead when you're ready. Uh, I'm Andrew Buckley uh, from Chatham. Uh, you know what, the main problem is I keep on saying uh every other word. Yeah, you do. Um, want me to go first? Yeah, you go. My name's Matthew Griffin uh, from Chatham, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, and I'm working with Andy on uh, the story of the Columbia Expedition. The first. Uh, American ship to circumnavigate the globe. which the American John Ledyard was on, um, they knew, quite by accident, having collected these sea otter pelts on the northwest coast, because they knew that they were headed up into the Arctic. And they, they wore them, they slept on them, and nonetheless, after having done that for a few months in Canton, they were offered what were to them phenomenal amounts of money. We think of John Ledyard as the herald. He's able to take this story of how to make money and give it to the people who can put it into action. He never is able to do it himself. It was a simple idea. Ledyard said, start off from the east coast of the United States. You take some a shipload of uh, manufactured goods that nobody in Europe wanted. You bring them down around Cape Horn, up to the northwest coast. You trade those things to the uh, natives on the northwest coast for sea otter furs. Stop in Hawaii for a little R&R &R with the local girls. You resupply. You go across the Pacific to China. 
You trade those in Canton for silks, porcelain, tea, back, down, around the Cape of Good Hope, back up to the United States, and you got yourself a fortune. You know, actually, it kind of reminds me of uh, Marco Polo. That Marco Polo is known as Il Milione, you know. He's got the schemes for making money. And, and that seems to have just really almost possessed Ledger, the idea of how he could get backing to have a voyage that would go and exploit uh, the value of these pelts from the Northwest Coast of Canton. Ledger couldn't find any takers at home. It's only a matter of time before somebody else set up their own training mission. So he ended up pitching his idea in London and Paris, becoming fast friends with the American ambassador, Thomas Jefferson. This was one of the great investment opportunities of all time. Uh, Joseph Burrell uh, was an up-and-coming guy. He was in the eighth decile, I think that's called, um, of, uh, in 1771-1772. That means he wasn't very rich. And he was basically a grocer. What can you tell us about the, the uh, owners, different owners uh, or the backers of the Columbia Expedition? They were desperate for something to sell essentially. Um, New England had no resources whatsoever. Um, people settling it came to look for stuff. And um, they built up an economy based on trade, on, on, based on shipping, essentially. Sort of like UPS. He was at that point a successful merchant, an investor. Who was he? Uh, John Derby, one of the owners, and his family was Actually, I do have that. I have a clip on that. You have a clip on what? On John Derby, whose family was in the China trade. He was brought in as a major partner because his family had established the China trade from Salem. They showed that you could make money by bringing goods directly from Salem, straight around the Cape of Good Hope, uh, to China and then back again. And Boston was looking at a different way. 20 miles away, just down the shore, and they were going to go a totally different route and circumnavigate the globe. And he had connections, he knew people, and apparently he thought that this would be a, a good venture, particularly after the success a couple of years earlier of his older brother's vessel, the Grand Turk, uh, sailing to Canton and back. The Syndicate. Are we still filming here? Yeah, I've, I've just been rolling. So. Oh, okay. Well, we've got to be able to uh, connect Thomas Jefferson with John Ledyard. John Ledyard was with Thomas Jefferson at the same time that Charles Bullfinch was doing his grand tour of Europe. They were moving in the same circles. And so Bullfinch brings the story back to Boston. Uh, and they're able to put together this group of people in his father's townhouse in Bowdoin Square. So we've got to be able to say that. You just did. <laughs> So pretty soon this crew realizes this is not going to be some one-time documentary film. It's going to be a show, like an adventure travel show, but about history. Yeah, people are watching the story, but they're loving these men, making their way, traveling, documenting history. We're saying, yeah, keep going, keep doing it, follow that dream. We're going to go around the world.